right, amen. Can y'all hear me? All right, good morning. Good morning to all of you this morning on this uh, warm and cozy uh, morning. Um, uh, please pray in prayer. We have quite a few of our saints out today with all assortments of allergies and sinus infections and all sorts of things. And if you haven't been affected for this week, it's probably last week and more to come. So uh, please be in prayer uh, for them. It's good to see some faces here also. Uh, haven't seen us. Everybody's been out on the break and stuff like that. Uh, it's also good to see the Cooley family here who is now visiting us from out of town as they have moved on to Oklahoma, but it's good to see them visiting with us uh, this morning. Um, as Pastor Norman uh, noted uh, this morning as he read the parable of the talents, uh, it syncs well with uh, Paul's exhortations here where we are in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, where Paul is, been dealing, is beginning to deal with an assortment of problems uh, that is worldliness that is prevailing in the Corinthian church. Uh, and one of the first things he had to deal with is the ch church division, where they have divided on four different teachers in the church, including Jesus Christ, who has become a source of division. Okay? And so, uh, so as he's gone through the next couple chapters and stuff like that, uh, we spent some time uh, opening chapter 3 last week, where Paul starts to get to the root of what all these issues is about, and it is a lack of spiritual maturity. Uh, and so now as we go into verses 5 through 9, he expands his thoughts on this. Uh, while they are spending so much time uh, giving esteem to ministers of the gospel, which do not belong to ministers of the gospel, that type of glory does not belong to ministers of the gospel, he has to now remind them what a servant of God is, and that a servant of God is to serve to the glory of God. And any good that comes out of not just a preacher of the gospel, but also a Christian, that that glory should be given to God alone. And he focuses some of his attention here in verses 5 through 9 of 1 Corinthians 3. And so uh, we're going to read uh, 1 Corinthians 3, but we're going to start at verse 1 so we can have some foundation from last week. Uh, but our focus here today will be verses 5 through 9. So I ask if you can stand, please stand as we read the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. Verse one. He says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants to whom you believe, as the Lord has assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have not only blessed us with salvation, but you saved us for a purpose. You saved us to serve you to your glory. You saved us also that our primary, primary uh, way and primary reason for being your church and existing is to bring glory to your name by the life that we live in your son, Jesus Christ. So help us as we learn more what it means to grow spiritually, to understand this truth about your salvation, about your works, and about our responsibility and obligation to grow with you in serving as well. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, we are studying uh, First Corinthian Church, which I have often said that if you read all the letters of Paul and you understand the historical context of the Corinthian Church, they more model us today 
uh, in our American culture as the Corinthian church is also an affluent society marked with all sorts of entertainment, all sorts of paganism and false god worship, etc., etc. Uh, and like them today, you know, they were giving, you know, glory to men for all their gifts and all these various things in the church instead of glory is coming to God. And whenever you give glory to men, that means worldliness is prevailing. That means spiritual immaturity is prevailing. And therefore, you will have the outworks of such worldliness. And this starts with division, with them saying that the congregation is split up into four different factions. I follow Paul. I follow Paulus. I follow Cephas, which is Peter and I follow Christ, right? And so in this way of thinking, and we see this even in our own American culture, where men who are supposed to be declaring the gospel are held with such high esteem and affirmation, and we say, oh, there's a great man of God, there's a great woman of God, and all these various things. But here's the truth. When you read the Old to the New Testament, there is no great man of God, but a great God of men. And this truth is lost in a church culture that idolizes ministry leaders like celebrities. We live in a culture where the pastor cannot be a pastor. He becomes, has to be a CEO. He becomes a brand that he has to look apart and say the part because he's supposed to attract all these people into the church. We'll forget the fact that when you read the book of Acts, it is God who adds to the church when there is faithful teaching and preaching of the gospel. And so when we live in a church culture where such a worldly mindset now and then has infiltrated the Corinthian church as they gave esteem to men which only belong to God, which has now become a source of factionalism. And Paul endeavors now to set the record straight by reminding them of the true station of a minister. And I would say even to an everyday Christian in comparison to God as we co-labor with God in his kingdom work. And this Sunday, we, he highlights the key roles of a servant in the ministry work that applies to all Christians, but especially to preachers of the gospel. And today, I'd like to offer three reflective questions that we should examine today as we explore these few verses of Paul's writings. So let's look at our first reflective question. The first question we should ask us as we look at verse 5 is, what is a minister to God's church? Now, remember, you know, we have human government, right? And who established human government? God. No matter how flawed, how messed up and jacked up the Bible, it's clear that God establishes human government. Why? Because he wants order in society. One of the things that God despises in society is anarchy and chaos, right? He wants order in society. Now, if he wants order in society, what about his church, Right? God has established a leadership structure within his church order so that things will be done in decent and in order and according to his word, right? Now, some has called this leadership structure, which Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 4, as the fivefold ministry, right? You know, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, speaking of God, he says, and he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers, right? You know, Paul talks about these leadership roles in the church. And then when you go to Paul, you go to Paul's writing to Timothy and Titus, he gives more specific qualifications of churches such as elders and deacons, right? But why has, what is the reason as God has established these roles in the church? If you go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and you keep reading in verse 12 to 14, Paul tells you. He says, to equip, right? To equip the saints for the work of of the ministry. Tonight, like the third servant in the parable of the talents, to take what God has given you and sit on your hands, right? But he established church leadership to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the what? The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Verse 14, he says, so that we may no longer be children, right? That is, babes in the faith. Children who are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So church leadership is put in together so we can build each other up, so we can know what God's will is rightly. We can interpret the scriptures correctly because if you have a correct interpretation of scripture, you can live correctly. 
we can abide with each other correctly and we can exude the glory of God in our lives. And so Paul and Apollos, right, remember who are they to the church? What was their role? They are apostles of God. They are elders in the church. They had stature and positions of importance within the body of Christ. But Paul poses a question that challenged the way some of us might think of these positions. He says in verse 5, he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? And then in verse 5, he continues, he says, then he reminds us, he says what? Servants, right? Servants to whom you have believed as the Lord has assigned to each. Let's unpack that for a little bit, right? Number one, remember, positions have value as God wants to establish church order, right? He has established certain positions between men and women and how we all work together to do church, right? To be together and to do his work of the gospel. However, the roles and duties of a servant of a Christian are more important than his position and the title that he holds, right? We've got a lot of folks getting into the ministry for human gain because we got a title on the door. Right. You got some places where you go to some churches, you can't even uh, you can't even talk to the man of God because you got to use all his titles. Apostle, reverend, doctor, all these various names. I said, well, can I just talk to the preacher, please? Right. You got to use all these titles because that's what we in it for. But that doesn't concern himself with God because it's not the reason why he gave those things. He wants order. But the work is what's important It's who we are and what we do for Jesus. That matters. Right. Number two, the church is not to focus so much on personality and giftings and skills when it comes to value. Are they important? Yes. But when what someone does becomes more important to you than what they, who they are in Jesus, we got a problem. You end up measuring someone in a way that God does not. But whether we also place more value on, them, on their identity as a child of God and the works they are performing within the name and the will of God of Christ, right? Because if it just becomes about, well, this person has skill, we want to use them, but how to do these different things and whatnot, what happens when they can't do it no more, right? They ain't no more value to the church, right? You know, and that's wrong, right? The point is that no servant of God, no matter the position, should be idolized, uh, but instead God should be glorified in the work that he does for them and through them, right? Now, should we be thankful for each other? Yes. Should we be able to show appreciation for those who serve from the back to the front? Absolutely. We should say thank you. We should have that affection and that gratitude for one another. But that affection should never morph into worship. Right? Because it should not, and it should not cause division. Because worship only belongs to God. And this is why Paul is asking them as this is how they're dividing up amongst themselves. He asks them, well, who then is Apollos? What is Paul? In other words, what real value do servants have in comparison to the work of God and God himself, right? Because remember what the role of a servant of God is, right? The role of a servant of God, especially Pacific and the elder, is to bring people to faith in Christ, not ourselves, right? The role of when men pass an arm and stand up here, when we talk to you in your life, is to hold up a sign that points up where it says, Jesus, this way right? Jesus this way, right? Our role as a Christian is to be instruments of God's grace and mercy to draw a following to God, not to ourselves. And that's hard in our social media culture. And we don't realize how much we bring that culture and that thinking into the church as I'm trying to collect all these followers, all these people to myself and all these likes and all this stuff like that. And that's not God's way of doing things, right? Because you start living more for the affirmation of men than being pleasing unto God. Remember I said before, why do we exist as a servant? We exist for God's glory. We do not exist in serving God for our own equity and esteem like you see in some churches where there's a gospel message that is man-centered, that is twisted and used for personal gain and for social political ideologies. That's not the gospel, my friends, and that's why when you have those things prevailing in the church, guess what else is there? Spiritual immaturity, and worldliness. That's what you're going to have. And last, remember that the servant of God, and you've heard me say this a few times behind the pulpit, as we serve God, remember, we're not doing God any favors, right? We're not doing God any favors. Remember, the Bible is clear that we are saved to serve God, and in doing so, we do our duty, 
our obligation. We are commanded to serve God. And to make sure this is clear to Jesus' own disciples, what does he say to them in Luke 17? He pulls them to the side in Luke 17, and this is in verse 7 to 10, and he says these words to them. He says, well, any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping a sheep, say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. In other words, when your servant is out there who belongs to you, comes in the house, do you say to him, you know what, you had a long day. Go and sit down and take a load off, and I'm going to go ahead and take it the rest of the way. You know, I, I'll go and help you out. But Jesus says in verse 8, he says, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me? And dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and after it you will eat and drink. In other words, when you serve in God, that's a hard work. And when you get done out in the field, you're going to come in the house, you're going to have to take a shower and get cleaned up and put on some clean clothes and go into a completely different occupation for God, right? You know, and then Jesus says these words, even after you've served God and you've done all these things, because remember, there's a benefit in us serving God that we are blessed with God's grace and his favor on our life when we serve God. Remember, serving is an act of faith. It is faith in our works playing itself out, right? But even in all those things, Jesus says in verse 9, he says, but does he thank the servant? Because he did what was commanded. Verse 10 says, so I also, so you also, when you have done all that you commanded, say, we are in a worthy service. We have only done our duty. Remember, we are saved to serve God, not out of merit. Not because, you know, God owes us anything or because we're trying to stack up credits with God. But we serve God because we love God. And as ministers, uh, as ministers, we are instruments of God, heralds of his gospel to whom you have believed. Right. As Paul as as a sign to each. In other words, God has given us all different skills and temperaments and giftings, right? When we get to 1 Corinthians 12, you're going to see how God has spread out all the spiritual gifts throughout the church. So no one person has all the gifts, right? He meant for us to be a little bit over here, and uh, Norman, Pastor Norman had a little bit there. John has some there. Kendra has some over there. You know, you got James in the back. Everybody's got a little bit of gifts. If you are in God and you've got the Spirit, he gave you gifts to use for his glory, right? To work together. But even in all those gifts that we have to work together for what God has given you, we shall be held account for, right? More on that later. So let's look at our second reflective question as we go through the text, right? The second question is, what is the minister's value in reference to God and the gospel work, right? Paul continues in verse 6. He says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. What is Paul doing here? Remember, Paul is a master teacher. He uses an agriculture metaphor, right, in a way to communicate a distinction between Paul and Apollos, how they labor for God. In other words, Paul planted, what is a reference to? That he established churches, right, which was essentially the function of an apostle, right? You know, he even talked even talk about that in Acts 18, how Paul actually goes to Corinthians, right, and he established them. And how long does the Bible say he stayed there? 18 months, right? 18 months. And he says, stays there and he establishes them at a church. But then he also says here, Apollos water. In other words, Apollos remained behind when Paul left to nurture the church and the scriptures for spiritual growth and service from the seeds that Paul planted, right? And though the work of the ministers is vital to church fruitfulness, our labors come to nothing if God is not involved, right? Me and Pastor Noam, we can sit up here and preach till we blue in the face. We can go on and on and on. But if God is not here with us doing the work, it will come to nothing. And the work that Paul and Apollos committed to themselves would be in vain if God had not continued to increase the church spiritually and numerically. Right? In other words, if God does not go ahead of us, if he does not come alongside of us, if he does not work through us and for us, we can do nothing. You know, you think about Psalm 127, verse 1, where it says that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Why? Why? Because remember, God wants his glory, right? Remember, God shares no glory with humans 
on this side of heaven. When the Bible talks about us being glorified, that's in the new creation, my friends. When we can put away the sinful flesh and all these things that we naturally seek the glory of God and our human nature, when that's all put away and we in heaven with God, we'll be glorified. But on this side of heaven, we are to live in such a way where God can be glorified through us. Remember, the end product of God's will is always his glory. Everything he gives us to do is always going to lead to his exaltation. That's the reason why sometimes when we ask ourselves a question, well, what would God have me do? How would God have me think? Then what you also ask yourself is, well, what I'm thinking, of, will it glorify God according to the scriptures? And if it will, you're probably on the right track. Remember Peter's words, verse Peter chapter 4, verse 10 through 11. He says, as each has received a gift, that is a gift from God, right? Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who is served by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything, in order that in everything God may be glorified, through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right? And so Paul reminds us in the text that reminds us that the work prospers. Why? Because God prospers the work. Right? Because ultimately it's not about the minister, it's about the God ordained work and God who gives us success. That's why Paul says, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants, no, he who waters is anything, but it's only God who gives the growth, right? And to be clear, right, remember the work that the Christian performs is important to God. It is vital to God, as is the person who does them. God's not just concerned about what you do for him. He's concerned about you himself. You are his most prized possession, right? And as a servant of God, remember, we carry with the Bible. Paul says in other places in his writings that we carry with us the fragrance of salvation, the aroma of Christ everywhere we go to those who believe. And God has given his servants this kind of radiance, this glory of readiness, ready to go wherever he asks us to go in season and out of season to carry his glory. That's the reason why Paul quotes Isaiah in Romans 10, 15. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But in all these things, the minister, minister is nothing in comparison to God. Nothing. That before God, if we compare ourselves to what God does, we're like a vapor. That's here in a minute and blown away. We're like what Abraham, when he stood before the angel of the Lord and recognized that he was dust and ashes before God that we return to the dust in comparison to God. Remember I said before, we're not doing God any favors by serving him. We perform our duty. If you are a Christian, you are commanded to serve God with the things he's given you, right? But in the end, we should not get arrogant and be built up in pride as if we're doing God a favor. Because remember, let us be clear, God does not need us to care for his purposes. He could have preached the gospel himself from heaven. He could have moved his kingdom forward without human agency at all, right? He doesn't need anyone to advance his kingdom. And he doesn't even need us to give, us, give him human praise, right? Remember Luke 19, when Jesus comes in for his final time into Jerusalem, which we call the triumphal entry, right? And they line the rows up and they worship him. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is worship. He is old. And then the Pharisees, who did not glorify him, looks at Jesus and says, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what did Jesus say to them? He says, If these don't give my praise, the very stones will cry out. That God will get his glory. And so if that's the case, if God doesn't really need us to do these things, he could do them himself, why does he involve us? Why? Because God is into co-laborship, right? Co-laborship. Remember, co laborship is an expression of God's profound love for you and I. Because God wants a relationship with this creation. Remember, there's a reason why in the beginning of creation, before sin came into the creation, God could be heard and seen walking in the floor of the garden. Right? Right? That a part of dynamic, a part of that dynamic of co laborship and stewardship is what God creates that love relationship with us. Right? You remember when God did, made all the creation, right? And then on the sixth day, he made Adam and Eve, and he put Adam in the garden, right? 
Now, he didn't just put Adam in the garden just to chill in the cut and just be a consumer of God's goodness. No. What does he do? Before he even gives him a wife, what does he do? And I hope, hope all the men are hearing this. And the young man hears, he gave Adam a job. Right? He gave him a job. Right? He gave him responsibilities. He gave him his word. Right? And they had a relationship with each other. And even as Adam was naming the animals, and God took joy, and they had pleasure with one another in that dynamic. And when that was complete, God said these words, It is not good for man to be alone, but I will give him a helper. And he put Adam down in the ground, and he took woman from his own body to help him as they together serve God. That's the point. And you see God's plan for us even in the story of creation. And so now as you think about where we are right now and you look at the church and you look at your own life, remember that God does not call a perfect people, but he perfects the call. Remember only one time that the father uh, choose a completely sinless preacher. Only one time. And his name is Jesus. The rest of us, we messed up and we jacked up and we got all sorts of flaws and issues, but that's why we become Christians because he's given us his spirit that we may come out of those things and we will grow to the glory of God. Remember, I always said that if you're a Christian, you're still coming out of stuff. I remember when I first got saved and whatnot, I had a lot of problems. And when I got saved, I recognized a couple, one thing, I still had a lot of problems. I still had issues, right? But guess what? Now you have an advocate. And a part of your growth is not just receiving the word, it is living the word through service. Living the word through service, right? The work of a minister of the gospel does is important, but not at the level that we should be idolized as no Christian and glorified because that belongs to God alone. A minister's contribution and human attributes should also not, should not be a source of human division. But we see it all the time. This happened in the Corinthian church. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. And one group, I follow Christ. I'm not going to follow any human creature. We're going to follow Jesus. That's the same group that walks around now today and says, only God can judge me. Right? But this is what happens, right? And so as we think about what Paul is doing, because if you have discerned correctly, he's not just instructing them, but there is a, a hint of ingredient of rebuke in his words. Right? And as we think about what we thought about today, right, the two first two reflective questions is what? What is a minister to God's church, right? Well, question number two, what is the minister's value in reference to God and the gospel work, right? And now we get to question number three, how are ministers to labor together, right? How is a minister's service appraised by God? Because one of the things you see now, especially in pastoral circles, there is no unity. Right. I have never seen so much bickering and backfighting and all sorts of stuff going on just among the men of God in the church. Right. And it's no wonder why the church has the problems they have. But that's another sermon for another time. Now, verse eight through nine, Paul teaches that each minister has different gifts and roles in which we operate in the church. And he go ahead and he uses Paul and the Paul as an example. Right. Now, you remember with Paul, remember, he was an expert of the Old Testament law. He speaks to the fact that he was not only an expert, but he was excellent in the knowledge of God and writing, right? But he admitted he didn't speak well, right? But not so for Apollos. Apollos was a great orator, well-spoken, right, and all those types of things. But the idea was that those attributes was not supposed to be a source of division. The idea was that the church was not supposed to be doing a sanctified version of American Idol in the church, Okay, that's not supposed to be going on. The idea is that God built them differently that way on purpose so that they may work together, that they may depend on one another. Where one may look at the other and say, brother, I don't know what I'm doing with that, but you have experienced it. Would you help us do that? It takes humility to work together. And Paul teaches that though the ministers have different gifts and roles in which we operate in the church, we are to serve in a unified way way. So again, he returns to his agricultural metaphor. He says, he who plants and he whose water is what? One, right? One. Simply put, simply put, when two such workers work in the same field, right, they have different responsibilities, right? You may have some out there pulling weeds up and working in the ground. You may have another one on the track or something like that. But even though they have different roles and different things they're doing, right, what are they doing? They have one common objective, one common objective, And what is that? That is to see plants grow and eventually mature for a harvest, right? 
And remember, Paul defines the purpose of ministerial leadership, again, going back to Ephesians 4, verse 12, right? What does he say? He says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, equipping requires the work of sowing and cultivating spiritual growth in you and I. In other words, it's not our primary objective simply to serve people that they remain consumers only of God's goodness, right? And that's something we got to come out of because we live in a culture that's a consumerist society, right? Where we are taught from little, it is about me, it's about me getting as much as I can to serve myself, right? But that's not Christianity, that's not what God is doing when he is filling you up with his goodness, right? No, our goal is to train servants, make disciples that you may share that what each has received in the goodness of God with others, right? The whole point of God filling you up with his goodness is that he intends for it to overflow out of you where you can't keep it, where you can share it with others, and you know when someone is growing spiritually, when they start faithfully serving in the church. They start faithfully serving in their families. They start faithfully serving at their jobs. And everywhere they go, they're not turning the light switch on and off where I'm one way, this place, no place. No, everywhere they go, it becomes a way of life. Everywhere that they go. And like field workers, our hope is a mature harvest, not seedlings that never grow. It says, Paul, as we continue this message, Paul continues to expand his point. Though ministers, we are to labor in units. We have different gifts and talents, right? We are to labor in a unified way. But Paul reminds us that we are judged individually by God for the work that we do, right? So he says in verse 8, each will receive the way his wages according to his labor, right? Right? In other words, our individual labors for God is not overlooked by him. Though you and I labor together and we have different experiences, different roles and stuff like that, one day you and I are going to stand before God and give an account, right? There is no group grade before God, right? And it, that God is not going to be testing on the curve, right? Everybody just get the same grade. No, you're going to have to account for what God has given you. It's not about what God has not given you. You can't be held responsible for those things. What has he given you in this season of life and how are you using that to God's glory? We will all have to stand before God individually to give an account. And that's essentially the story that Pastor Norman read of the parable of the talents. That's what it's about, right? That's what it's about, that, that there's a master and he has slaves, he has servants, right? He's got three of them, and he sends them out not with they stuff, the master stuff, right? His stuff, and he gives them an endowment. He gives them this stuff, and they're supposed to go into the marketplaces of life and do business on behalf of the master and come back, not simply with what they have, but whatever God gives you is meant to multiply. It's meant to, to duplicate, right? They're supposed to go do that. And the Bible says there in the story that Jesus tells after a long period of time, which is a reference to the, reference to the coming judgment, that the master returns. And each one of them had to send, even though they went into the same marketplace. They had to stand before their master. And likewise, you and I are given specific gifts, talents, resources. It's not about who has more and who has less. What has God given you? What has he given you? It's about what he has given you that a day is going to come where you have to give account for those things. That all of us are supposed to take the life that he's given us and go into instead the public squares of life the public squares of life, and spread the gospel so that God can multiply his children, his sheep, who hears his voice to his kingdom, right? Kingdom. And so each of us in that day will receive an individual praise and commendation for the work we've, uh, that we have done in serving God. And here's the key. If we have faithfully, if we were faithfully labor for God, right, there will be joy in the presence of God on that day with us by which we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But if we have failed to serve God, if we ignored his prompting from his spirit to grow and labor in ministry, if we did nothing with the gifts and resources that he's given us for his glory. Because sometimes what we're doing is we're collecting his resources for ourselves, for our own glory, but we do nothing for God. But if we don't use those things for his glory, we shall be met with shame and disapproval of God in the day when we will hear you wicked and slothful servant. 
And unfortunately, we have those who attend churches all over America who demonstrate more zeal for the care of their own houses, their own future aspirations, their own resources, while they neglect God's house and his will for their lives. And according to God, this is evil in his sight. And we must remember that everything we possess is given to us as stewards, not as a possession. Stewards of God's various graces, what Peter says. Everything we have and we are is to be used for God's will and glory. And no matter what role in which we serve in God's church, it is important whether the roles is seen or unseen. And ministers are called to work together in unity, cultivating the word of God and his people as his holy church. That's why Paul says, for we are, in verse 9, says, for we are God's fellow workers, speaking to the apostles and elders. You are God's field, God's building, right? And so when it comes to God's purposes, it's not about individual persons, right? God cares about us individually, but he more cares about what we do together. It's about God's people growing in his service, growing in his living. And the more we grow spiritually, the more we will serve in a way that glorifies God. The more that the church will, will truly be the city on the hill in the midst of the valley of darkness around us, right? Because the goal is what? It's ultimately not for people to see you and I. It's for them to see Jesus, to see Jesus living in you, but by you, how you behave and how you live and how you think and what you do, right? That's what it's about. Servants for God's glory, that you have been saved for God's glory in everything. It's not just service in the church. It's with your families. It's with your children. It's with broken relationships. How, does God, how is God glorified in you if you are harboring bitterness in your heart for a family member? How is God glorified in you if you have unforgiveness but everybody looks at it, that's a Christian? But we act like the world, right? And that's not what God wants for you. And here's why. What you don't realize and what we have uh, discovered, as we, because we read it in the scriptures, but we don't always believe it. But what you don't realize is that true fulfillment, true satisfaction, true joy comes in walking and living and thinking in the will of God. That's where it comes from. And when you believe it, your faith will see it in your actions. We see faith living, we'll see it in your actions. And so the goal is, what Paul is trying to trust God. Return back to believe in what God has said, and we will glorify him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. That you have blessed us in Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. That you have feed, fed us your word, which is the bread of life, which sustains us that grows us and that you care about your people. You care so that we may grow closer to you, that we will have joy in a life in you and that we will see our life in the world exactly as you see it and as one we should depart from and so that we can live in the likeness of your son. And so help us as a church to grow. Put those desires more in our heart to grow in your word. To grow not only individually in our personal lives, but also grow collectively in the mission of the church. And so we just pray, Father Lord, that this word would not depart from our hearts. And that you would help us in humility to embrace it, that in trust that we will walk in it. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.